Tommy is all the way here from Lagos, Nigeria. He's the professor of, of public policy and management at Lagos Business School. And he's been here in Rome this week lecturing for Acton Institute um, in our office and at the Pontifical Gregorian University, the Jesuit University in Rome, where he gave a lecture on African development, specifically focusing on Nigeria. Well, here we are, Professor, in the heart of ancient commercial life. And, um, in ancient Rome, this is known as the Forum, but there are actually many forums. We're in front of what's called Trajan's Forum. Just behind us are the markets which Trajan built and the open amphitheater. Here we have the Trajan's Column and the two churches that were once um, Greek and Roman libraries. And on the other side of the hill, you see the Capitoline Hill and the greater Roman Forum, the original Forum over there by the Palatine Hill. I'm here with you today, Professor, to speak um, initially about what Roman commercial life was like. And we're in the, probably at the height of what was called the Pax Romana during the reign of the five good emperors. Trajan, second of which, was a good emperor, and they, they, were, they were good times for the Romans. Um, they're particularly good times because Trajan had just concluded two great wars in the eastern provinces, known as Dacia, which would have been the Soviet satellite countries of Russia, of, of Romania, and Moldavia. And those were particularly rough barbarians who frequently tried to attack Rome from the east. So he stabilized the empire and it grew as far as it ever went under Trajan. Um, secondly, he provided a lot of cultural reforms and commercial reforms. Um, so right here in the forum, this represents one of the greatest advocacies of commercial life in Roman antiquity. Uh, Trajan did a number of good things as a good emperor. He united the currencies. There were several, several problems with exchange rates, just like there is today in the nations that were, had separate currencies in the, in the economic um, community of Europe. And now it's the European Union. Um, he liberalized uh, the guilds, so you didn't need, mem they didn't need paid membership to become a, par uh, a carpenter or a plumber or an architect. Um, but most importantly, he established a court of commercial law right here on the top floor of Trajan's market. Those were areas in which disputes over legal contracts could be settled or negotiated. And that was a, that was a first in Roman antiquity. Um, most importantly, we're looking at a physical reminder of one of the greatest feats of Roman engineering, this is the Trajan's markets. It was originally five floors, and now it's a total of seven floors. And inside the markets, we found uh, taverns, restaurants, uh, there was outdoor entertainment here in the square, but above all, it was a market full of luxury boutiques for selling the finest goods found throughout the empire. Spices, silks, clothing, precious metals, um, everything you can imagine that was high class. So it was literally like the Herods of ancient Rome. Um, so, but none of this was possible, uh, according to legend, until this area was, was rid of what the Romans called la mala aria, the bad air. The modern word that derives that is called malaria. So in this area between the Chelian Hill behind us and the, the two Capitoline Hills and Palantine Hills was a great floodplain for the Tiber River. In this great floodplain, we can imagine that it was very low-lying water and it created sort of this stench, this bad smelling air. So as legend had it, the Romans said, before we're going to build our, the eternal city, this great republic for the Latin nations, we have to get rid of this bad air. What we do know from the history books is that the primitive Bronze Age villagers here, who were Etruscans, um, were quite uncivilized, unproductive, lazy, slow moving, and not very populous. In your seminar with us the other day, you talked about some of the demons of development, some of the impossibilities to develop in Africa. And there's a school of thought among economic, uh, theorists, economic development theorists that is quite pessimistic, right? And some of the pessimists, they, they, they play the blame game. They say, Africa is not destined to develop. Why isn't it destined to develop? It has poor geography, too much sand, too much jungle. And theorists like Jeffrey Sachs actually blame the Malaria again. We find this once again blaming the malaria, literally the malaria. So in terms of malaria and other similar infectious diseases, how serious is it an impossibility 
towards true economic development in Africa? Well, I wouldn't call it an impossibility, but it points to a very critical element that needs to be engaged, which is healthcare. Um, when Jeffrey Sachs talks about uh, malaria and really to get Africa to develop, the world had to get together and help Africa get rid of malaria. Uh, he was not being, uh, should I say negative, but essentially saying, look, this is what we need to focus on so that Africa can be enabled to begin to develop. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think it's probably even better Angus Deaton, who won the 2015 Nobel mm -hmm. Prize in Economics, who focuses properly on this subject when he talks about the Great Escape. And the Great Escape is about how healthcare has been really central to development. Um, what we find in many, many poor countries is because healthcare is so poor, even those who go from being just statistic to human capital are not around long enough to deploy their talents to make for a better society. So healthcare is very critical to the development process. Um, however, it is more like a, an excuse for African leaders. Right. You know, so that... It doesn't make them not destined to develop. Yeah. yeah, they're not destined. That's too... You know, it's not a, a destiny thing. It's yeah. just, you're not focusing on the right thing. Yeah. If you can invest more sure. in education and healthcare, sure. then you're in a better position sure. to develop because you have the talent, the human capital that is in a position to drive the right. development of the country. So, um, a related theme is that some of these theorists talk about Afro-pessimism or two term as this kind of deep-seated negativity about Africa that it can't grow, it can't get over corruption, uh, it can't be politically stable, too much war, too much disease, too much desert, too much jungle, too much uh, non-collaboration between states. Is there really such a thing as Afro-pessimism, or is it more like anthropessimism, disbelief in man in general? Right. There was a season where there was a lot of this anthropessimism focused on Afri Africa, if you will. So it became known as Afro-pessimism. There was a season during which the media, particularly in an age of globalization that could take information to everybody's bedroom, literally, kept focusing on the civil wars on the continent, on the uh, famine, the, the, you know, the, uh, the disease, the poverty. Uh, and so an investor would say, why would I go to such a troubled region? Mm -hmm. So the capital flows that are important for development were not flowing into Africa. Really a major factor in the slow growth on the continent of Africa. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So, um, in terms of what you see as kind of the, the drivers for growth, you have your own framework that you develop. For example, Trajan himself had a framework. He, the first thing was political and territorial stability. Hence, defeat the nations, keep the barbarians out of civilized Rome, um, unite the currencies, solve the exchange rate problem, um, build more roads so that commerce can travel easily and safely, um, liberalize the, the guilds. You shouldn't have to pay to develop a profession. Um, and lastly, establish rule of law and a true cultus, a real culture of the gods and the religion to have a moral society. Is, this, is there anything you can draw from ancient tradition in your growth factor? Well, growth it, it just shows that in not too much has changed. We have just been going in circles as human civilizations, you know, really, truly. Uh, if you look at globalization, people talk about globalization as if it's a new thing. Pax Romana was globalization, and we have had waves of globalization. What amazingly has happened through human history is that you have trade lead to a lot of wealth, and then people begin to get envious of the wealth of their neighbors and begin to try to protect themselves, and you have bigger than neighbor policies. Bigger than neighbor policies often lead to economic depression. Economic depression leads to a level of anxiety that leads to a war, and the world just keeps going around these circles. Essentially the growth drivers framework that I have offered in reflecting on the challenges of development in Africa includes policy choices, uh, leaders making the right policy choices, which was what uh, people like uh, uh, Paul Coley helped on when someone like Jeffrey Sachs yeah. was focusing on the malaria, geography kind of uh, 
issues. Um, so policy choices. Leaders have to understand modern economies and make yeah. the right choices. Just tell us a, a little bit more about Paul Collier of Oxford. What? Well, uh, Paul Collier, who's been director of the Center for African Economies in Oxford for as long as I can think, took some time out to go and serve as a vice president of the World Bank, responsible for research and all of that. I have had a good fortune of collaborating uh, some with him uh, in the many years that I've been uh, focusing on these challenges. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but Paul uh, has, more than most people, helped Africa focus yeah. on the policy yeah. issues that are detrimental yeah. to development. Yeah, he's had some it's common sense to say in our, in our full feature documentary called Poverty Inc. He's very critical of the international aid agencies. Indeed. Uh, in fact, once in a while, Paul travels with an African lady who wrote a book on aid, uh, dead aid. Just to right. make a point, trade not aid. Yeah. Trade know? not aid. So, um, then is next in this framework that I yeah, offer, yeah. institutions. If you go back to when we're talking about the empire, and you're talking about the uh, courts up there, yeah. martial courts, yeah. these are the critical institutions that make markets work. Yeah. Uh, but you Create see a culture the, of trust and confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you see, uh, institutions set boundaries to conduct. And these boundaries reduce uncertainty and they allow people to be more disposed to engage in interco economic intercourse. And this is what really leads to economic growth and development. So institutions are so critical and they were so in the times that we speak about here uh, from Bax Romana. Then there's entrepreneurship. Right. Mm. You know, the whole creative destruction uh, thesis. Unless people can creatively destroy what was valued yesterday yeah. and create a whole new value. Yeah. Something that comes out of our yeah. nature because uh, I keep charging students. Right. Genesis 250 yeah. there. Yeah. Some of this thesis of creative destruction yeah. essentially is leaving out the two, uh, Genesis 250 that makes us literally co-creators with God, helping move creation towards its perfection. Right. So um, until we can build that culture, I often also look at how institutions, this, because the point about this framework is that they are interdependent variables. Mm -hmm. Institutions help entrepreneurship right. and, mm. and uh, frequently refer to the work of Raghuram Rojan and Luigi Zingales from the University yeah. of Chicago Law School of Business yeah. uh, on saving capitalism from the capitalists. That's right. And how that is so important in understanding how entrepreneurship grows. Mm -hmm. But all of these don't go anywhere until the right values do things together. Culture is central to human yeah. progress. Culture. You know, and then we see again how in old Rome, that was an emphasis. Yeah. For the Romans, culture was cultus, it was worship. Yes. Everything was derived from the faith. Right. Faith and trust in the so, gods. But who right. affects affect culture? Leaders. Leaders. The central role of leadership is to set the tone of culture. Yeah. Just a few more questions for you before we close. Um, during your lecture at the Gregorian on Saturday, you told some funny stories about these so-called super permanent secretaries to guide the, the Pax Nigeriana, let's call it that, after the colonization period. They were going to, with their good governance, as the good emperors like Trajan wanted to guide society with kind of platforms and frameworks for development. Sometimes they exaggerated in, in, their, in their rules and regulations. Is there any, anything that you'd like to tell us? What was well, well, what was interesting about that is that um, the economies of Africa that were emerging at the end of colonial rule generally imitated the colonizing country economies. Uh, and so what we took off with, we generally referred to as mixed economies. Mm -hmm. Mixed in the sense that uh, they were supposed to be market economies, but many of these recently educated Nigerian professionals who went into public service had gone to school in the UK, mm -hmm. had been significantly influenced like at the LSE, by London School of Economics, School of Economics yeah. which was founded by the Fabian Society. Right. The Fabians being uh, 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 intellectuals who right. decided that it was a war of attrition against laser fare, That's right. using the tactics of uh, Quintus Fabius Maximus uh, yeah, yeah. from here. Uh, and that's why they call themselves the Fabians. Slow buildup of propaganda and public policy. Right. right. So they, they managed to dominate thinking in the UK around this period with the LSE. Although I have to point out the irony of the fact that Frederick von Hayek, who was the ultimate pushback, right. literally on collectivist Britain, right. uh, also taught at the LSE about the same time that Harold Lasky 
who influenced many of these uh, Nigerian students, uh, was um, a, a dominant figure. But yeah. anyway, the influences of Lasky led them on returning home to seek to have uh, a greater influence of government. Right. In Nigeria, this was even heightened or facilitated yeah. further by oil wealth. So the government had all the resources from oil yeah. rent, and it was going to use it to mm. take over the commanding heights of the economy right. and drive change. Now, what this did was create what I like to call a parastatal friends. Every new day, they created one more government agency, right. take care of one more problem, yeah. and you really had as well. You know, and, and some of these permanent secretaries, like the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Industries, each permanent secretary was chair of a new parastata yeah. company set up under their watch. One man had as many as 200 parastatals he was a chair of. There was, there was no way he could be anywhere near effective. So you had this ridiculous situation that led to... Possible be executive committee member on... 200 state companies. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, last question, you know, what's what the hot topic in Rome in the past few weeks? There's one more week to go at the Bishop Synod held uh, just a few miles from here at Vatican City. Uh, it's, a, it's a synod on the Amazon. It's not just about the Amazon and, and the college, it's also about the, the, the consideration of female deacons or married men. But still, in the first week, they talked considerably about man's responsibility for the ecology of the Amazon in particular. However, do you think the fires from last summer, that you know, something like 80 fires last summer, have become a metaphor for those who advocate uh, more of a collectivist tradition of the economy? You know, the metaphor for like the slash and burn capitalism where man will do anything to create a profit, get rid of all species, jungles, precious wildlife, etc., just to have a successful business? Or is this an exaggeration of the fact, another case of anthropessimism? It, it, it is important in all of these kinds of discussion to come down to the fundamentals. It is very easy to jump on the bandwagon of a stereotype, because stereotypes make life easy. And so most people want to run into a stereotype and say, oh, this is, this is, this is and life is easy. But one of the things that the world has been offered through the social teachings of the Catholic Church is that a reasoned uh, approach to issues uh, with the gift of faith enables a pullback to look at the core of a matter. Yeah, right. I, I think that that's perhaps where I believe that the yeah. synod will end up in. It will take all the shades of opinions. Yeah. Some will be exaggerated in one direction or the other. But in the end, yeah. the gift of the Holy Spirit helps to uh, come to what is central to the nature of man in society, the gift of yeah. man in nature. That's right. I mean, the fear of evangelizers of the free market like you and I is that the church will make these sweeping generalizations about man's capacity for evil in the marketplace. But as you see here today, without without the pagan tradition, without, you know, it was a truly an evil society, we wouldn't have the goodness of commerce. So, from societies that weren't Christian, we did produce a good societies. And with Christian tradition, we can make those the best societies. Um, with that, I thank you, Professor. And we're going to take you on a tour of Trajan's Market and we'll go do some shopping. All right. All right. Yeah, it's amazing to come to an original mall, you know? <laughs> yeah. Good day, everybody.